Hello, everyone. Good afternoon uh, and good morning or even good <laughs> uh, evening to some of you uh, because we have very, very different participants from all around the world. Um, I'm thrilled and excited to open the seventh edition of Open Education Policy Forum. It was a crunch time for our forum uh, team, but now we are all here uh, full of energy to share this time with you and hopefully bring some uh, new insights to your work um, and just let's get our forum off the ground and uh, we will start with uh, Alexandra Olajanus, member of the board and Centrum Cifrova director and she will officially open uh, the forum but before Ola starts I want to give our thanks to partners, to unique partners who supported us uh, in each phase of our study, um, the Europeana Foundation and Euroclio um, and last but not least, thanks uh, go to our financial uh, supporter, uh, which made all the seven editions and this study happen, uh, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Thank you to all of you. Uh, so now, Ola, uh, is your time. Thank you so much, Anahita, and hello, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It is my great pleasure and honor to, to open the seventh um, Open Education Policy Forum. And I'm even more excited because I am personally at Centrum Cifrowe, I am the glam person. So I am thrilled to, to be opening this, uh, this forum, which brings together um, the, the two most most important areas of Centrum Cifrowe's interests and operations, which is open culture and open education. Uh, so it is a great pleasure for me and I'm looking forward to all the discussions that's going to happen. And I'm also very excited about the, the research data that we're going to share and discuss uh, with you during these, uh, these two days. So without further ado, uh, welcome everybody and I wish you all and us all a very fruitful uh, and interesting and inspiring two days. Uh, enjoy. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ola. So um, we have split our meetings in two parts and we will start with the reports lunch along uh, with a short up to 30 minutes discussion. And then after 10 minutes break, we will step into the lightning talks presentation. So this is our ag agenda in a nutshell. Um, and this is a time, finally, we have uh, come to the stage to make our final report out in the open. And Magda Biernat, who is also our member of the board and Centrum Cifrova director, uh, will launch uh, the result of the study. Uh, I will just remind you also to use our chat panel to ask the question during the presentation. And after we will have uh, space for uh, bringing up your question, maybe not all of them. So Magda, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Anahita. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes everything okay. is clear. Uh, can you also see my slides? Yes, we can okay, see your slides. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Anahita, very much for the introduction. Thank you, Ola. Um, and welcome, everybody, to the, uh, to the Open Education Policy Forum. It's a really great pleasure for me to be here today with you and a really great honor to present you the findings from our joint research. So in Centrum Cifrowe Foundation, we put special emphasis on research and data. Uh, we try hard to build each of our programs and projects on evidence. That's why our annual Open Education Policy Forum has for many years revolved around different studies conducted by Centrum Cifrowe in the field of open education uh, the studies conducted by Centrum Cifrowe are together or in cooperation with many other many partners. So um, just a quick reman reminder that in 2020, uh, during the Open Education Policy Forum, we discussed the positive impact of open education and open educational resources on remote education in the first year of the pandemic, just after the COVID-19 outbreak. The discussion was based on the research, Open Education as a Game Changer, Stories from the Pandemic. 
In 2022, uh, we tried to understand remote education during the pandemic from teachers and educators' perspective, putting special emphasis on um, levels of uh, adaptation uh, of open educational resources and different digital solutions across Europe. This year, uh, we will focus on the subject important for two open communities, open education and open culture. The title of this year um, of this year's study conducted by Centrum Cyfrowe in partnership with Europeana and Euroclio is Open Glam and Education, a Teachers and Educators Perspective on Digital Culture Resources. During the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, I will show you key findings from our research, and then I will present you most important recommendations on the development of heritage-based open educational resources uh, for educational use, uh, which we attempted to develop uh, based on evidence from our study. Then uh, we will discuss the findings with our guests from Europeana and Euroclio, and there will be also a space for your comments and your questions. So uh, let me start with research background. Uh, the research focuses on teachers and non for of views and barriers regarding the usage of digital interactive materials, uh, digital resources and online collection developed by or presented, developed or presented by um, cultural heritage institutions online. Um, by publishing this report and uh, by uh, preparing the recommendation, we would like to encourage uh, a great discussion among a wide range of stakeholders, including policy ma makers, including open education and open culture communities, and as well as cultural heritage institutions on policies, on programs, uh, on projects regarding the support of, uh, uh, of the, for the development of educational, open educational resources by cultural heritage institutions. But first of all, uh, why did we, we, we sorry, why did we decide to focus on the, on the subject? So first of all, because the use of heritage-based materials in education, uh, according to our expertise, our research and research documents is a very valid, important subject. According to the uh, 2021 study, uh, Remote Education During the Pandemic, 38% uh, of teachers from European, European Union countries use tools and materials created by GLAM, so cultural heritage institutions, during the period of remote education. Also, uh, many recent recommendations, um, such as, uh, for example, European Commission recommendation on, common, on a common European data space for cultural heritage or uh, policy analysis of value chains for cultural heritage institutions in the digital single market. Um, the documents point, point out that uh, the benefits of cooperation between cultural heritage institutions and education sector, and also the importance of use and reuse of heritage-based resources for educational purposes. So that's why we decided to explore the subject a little bit deeper. Um, open Glam and Education, uh, is, uh, was an exploratory research uh, consisting of uh, qualitative and quantitative parts. Uh, the sample size for quantitative part uh, of the study was 227 teachers and non-formal educators uh, that declare, declare the, use, the usage of uh, heritage-based uh, tools and resources and online collections for conducting uh, the educational activities. Most of our uh, survey teachers and educators uh, are part of Europeana Euroclio Creative Commons or UNESCO communities. 
uh, because we reach out to them via mailing lists or mailing groups uh, and newsletters of these organizations. It was our decision to involve teachers who are um, what we call um, heavy users of, uh, of these resources. So the findings from the quantitative uh, phase of the study, so the questionnaire-based part of the study, was uh, were then, then, uh, then further uh, explored uh, during in-depth interviews with five teachers and non-formal educators uh, from European countries. And just for clarity's sake um, uh, of the research, we've introduced uh, div the division or um, definitions of uh, resources used for educational purposes um, by uh, heritage-based educational interactive resources we understood we understand online digital tools like games quizzes virtual tools tours uh, used for different educational purposes by heritage-based resources educational resources we understand uh, online instructional materials like lesson plans, lesson scenarios, tutorials, and of course by online collections we understand digitized collection and context information, so image, video, sound, and uh, relevant meta metadata. Okay, so uh, let's move uh, to the key findings from the study. Uh, I will now show you 10 or 11 most important findings using relevant charts and uh, uh, using relevant charts and statistics. Uh, so the first uh, part of key findings, uh, in the first uh, part we will have a look at the way um, teachers and non-formal educators use heritage-based uh, resources. So um, first of all, let's have a look at what types of digital resources are used uh, most frequently. As we can see on, the, on, on this chart, uh, it turns out that online collections, uh, together with context information, are the most frequently used resources, with 85% of teachers and educators using them uh, while uh, conducting educational activities. 70% of uh, respondents confirmed that the use of um, educational interactive web-based materials, uh, so quizzes, games, uh, virtual tours, uh, while 64% um, admit that they use educational digital resources, such, lesson, such as lesson plans, lesson scenarios, um, uh, different kinds of tutorials. Mm. So now let's see subjects in which uh, teachers and educators use heritage-based resources. So uh, as you can see, the collected data um, reveals uh, that the, these resources are used uh, by teachers and non-formal educators to teach a really great variety of subjects, uh, starting with reading, writing, literature, uh, which was pointed out by 30, uh, 35% uh, of uh, surveyed teachers and educators. Um, then uh, history, 35%, then arts education, 26%, foreign language, 25%, natural sciences, uh, 23%, uh, media education and digital literacy related classes, 23%, ICT, 15%, technology, 13%, and what is really surprising for me, even mathematics work uh, 12%. So um, really uh, uh, teachers and, and educators use those resources for teach a really great uh, variety of, of, of subjects. So how about, uh, how about the frequency uh, of use of heritage-based resources by teachers and educators? So um, the study shows that teachers who are aware, of course, the, the teachers who are aware of the existence of the heritage-based resources use them quite frequently. 
Uh, because as you can see here, uh, when we add the, the percent, 72% uh, of survey teachers and educators use them at least several times, times a month. So uh, really quite frequently, in my, in my opinion. So uh, now let's move to the benefits and advantages of uh, the usage of heritage-based resources. Uh, so uh, as you can see on this chart, the survey teachers and educators point out quite many uh, advantages uh, of, uh, of those resources. 70% of them declare that they use those kinds of resources because they help them prepare very engaging and more creative lessons. 55% uh, claim that they are modern, they are cutting edge, 52% uh, that they are innovative. Uh, then 54% uh, admit that they inspire them to create, uh, to reuse or to create their own resources. Also, during interviews with teachers and educators, uh, teachers and educators during the interviews pointed out that um, heritage-based tools and resources enable them to teach about shred European cultural heritage to provide context or to introduce uh, a theme crucial for good uh, deep understanding of the subject, but also enable them to teach about the history of the subject. Uh, so methods, materials, tools used throughout the time or about famous contributors. So, uh, so um, when it comes to um, teachers and educators' perception of heritage-based tools and resources, uh, I think the data is clear. Uh, the more resources are available for educational purposes, the better. Uh, 94 of survey teachers and educators agree that uh, digital heritage-based resources are important and help them uh, perform educational activities. 86% of them claim that each cultural heritage institution should develop such materials. And 84% agree that such resources help them implement curricula or educational programs. So how, uh, now um, on this slide, we can see uh, Mm, the reuse of heritage-based resources and collections, uh, collection items. So um, I think uh, it's clear from the study that uh, resources, uh, um, heritage-based resources provide a really great basis for the creation of teachers and educators' own resources. 70% um, of respondents claim that uh, they create their own res educational resources reusing existing ones in order to meet the specific needs of the pupils. Pup pupils. Also, uh, flexibility, reusability, and the adaptability of uh, educational resources um, to different audience needs uh, were pointed out as a key advantages in uh, during the interviews with teachers and educators. So uh, let's move to the part three of key findings. And uh, in this part, we will see what teacher thinks about the disadvantages or barriers uh, regarding uh, this kind of resources. Uh, Okay, so uh, first of all, um, huge dispersion and difficulty with finding, fi finding sorry, heritage-based resources are the major barriers for teachers and educators. 40% of uh, respondents claim that they are hard to find. 32% uh, state that they are not gathered in one place, platform or catalog and 32% believe that they are not well promoted. 
Another very important advantage, uh, disadvantage of, um, of, of those resources is unclear copyright status of resources. Um, and we can see that there is a significant um, lack of copyright knowledge. Uh, I mean, only 57% uh, of teachers and educators claim that they usually know the legal status of educational uh, resources, of educational her heritage based, uh, based resources they use. Um, also, 16% uh, claim that they don't know the status normally, usually, and 26% uh, claim that uh, it is very hard to say what the legal status is. What is more, uh, 32% of teachers and educators declare that unclear copyright status in the had in the past prevented them uh, from using interactive materials, uh, digital resources, and online collection for uh, educational uh, purposes. Um, now let's have a look at the way um, teachers and non-formal educators search for those kind of uh, those kind of uh, kind of materials. So uh, on this chart, you can see some searching strategies. Uh, first of all, uh, as we've already seen, uh, heritage-based resources and online collections are according to our respondents, highly dispersed. That is why they use many different searching strategies with uh, the most popular being searching engines, 66%, uh, different educational platforms, 57%, uh, websites of cultural heritage institutions, 40, uh, sorry, 54%, Wikipedia, Wikimedia with um, 41%, and Europeana with um, 38%. Uh, so let's see what platforms and websites, websites teacher use as a source of um, heritage-based resources. This was non-obligatory question, um, but this chart also, um, the data, this chart uh, also confirm, confirms huge dispersion of resources. Um, teachers and educators, when asked, for links to their favorite uh, heritage-based tools and resources or online collections, provided 22 links to Europeana resources, nine to Historiana, six to Wikimedia, five to Polona, five to Google, Google Arts and Culture, and over 70 links to other smaller sources of, um, of materials. Mm. This slide is very interesting, in my opinion. Uh, this slide shows us that the usage of uh, foreign sources is very common uh, because 73% uh, of survey teachers and educators um, use resources from European Union countries other than the country of residence. And 42% uh, from countries from outside European Union. So uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting findings, in my opinion. So um, now, um, my last slide is about COVID-19. Uh, we know from uh, 2021 a research that 38% um, of teachers use, uh, used heritage-based resources during the time of remote education. But what about the time after the pandemic? What is COVID-19 pandemic impact on the usage of uh, those materials by teachers and educators? So actually it turns out that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and remote teaching uh, haven't, had a, haven't had a significant influence on the frequency of the usage of heritage-based resources. Uh, because uh, 93 of survey teachers and educators use those resources during the period of time uh, of remote education, and 92% assert that they use them also after uh, the pandemic, after 
the return to schools and educational institutions. Uh, for sure, we need to remember that our um, sample group is very specific, that uh, they are really heavy users of those resources. So um, uh, I will stop here, uh, here with uh, the findings from the study. More findings and more statistics you will, you will find in our final report published on the uh, research website. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the link is uh, available now in the chat. But I'd like to uh, move uh, now to our recommendation. Uh, and conclu conclusions and recommendations. Uh, so um, taking, um, taking into account all the evidence from the study, uh, we've made a first approach uh, to develop um, relevant recommendations on the development of heritage-based open educational resources for educational uh, use. And uh, here are uh, the most important ones. So first of all, Obviously, our recommendation is that we need to ensure and to support the creation of tailored digital resources for educational purposes. So what does it mean exactly? Um, in our opinion, it means that uh, the creation of open and accessible tools and resources for education uh, should be in the heart of uh, operational process of each cultural heritage institution, uh, of course, uh, operating online. Uh, also, it, mean, it means for us that uh, European Union, national, regional, and community level um, strategies, financial programs, and other programs regarding digitization of cultural heritage should explicitly uh, support the creation of resources dedicated to educational purposes. Uh, it is also important uh, uh, that the exchange of knowledge and the exchange of uh, best practices between different cultural heritage institutions and educational institutions, uh, is, this, this, uh, this exchange of knowledge is very important. And uh, we should support this, uh, this exchange uh, because uh, this uh, help us to maximize uh, the quality and the impact of those resources. Um, our second recommendation uh, is to make heritage-based resources open and accessible. So first of all, uh, it is very, very important that copyright law should not constitute, uh, to constitute a barrier for teachers and non-formal educators uh, preventing them from the access, use, reuse, uh, adaptation, uh, public performance and dissemination of heritage-based resources for any cultural, educational, sorry, purposes. Um, resources uh, for education should be also free, of course, and available under open licenses uh, or as a public domain with very clearly label, labeled, easy to find, and user-friendly right statements. This should be easy to understand uh, and to implement by teachers, by non-formal educators, by students, and by pupils. Also, promotion communication uh, is very crucial. Promotion and uh, we really need to support pr uh, promotion and communication about the availability of existing heritage-based resources for educational purposes. Um, in our opinion, it is very important, uh, resources also should be less dispersed, easier to find and easier to search. Uh, we also need to um, ensure that uh, materials digitized with public funding are available through national, national and international aggregating platforms like Europeana, because this way they are uh, much easier to find. Heritage-based resources for education should be also accessible to uh, people with disabilities. So uh, in our, our opinion, it is really cru crucial 
uh, is ne really necessary to follow accessibility guidelines while, while creating them. We should do also our best to make resources available trans transnationally and the creation of multilingual uh, resources should also be supported. Um, our third recommendation uh, is about uh, prioritizing the creation of engaging, inspiring, modern or cutting edge uh, heritage based resources for education, and also about providing relevant uh, training for employees of uh, cultural heritage institutions. So first of all, um, uh, evidence-based standards and guidelines uh, for the creation of heritage-based resources um, are very important. Also, um, the creation of engaging, uh, inspiring uh, heritage-based resources, uh, we know that the, the creation requires knowledge of the latest technological trends, uh, di di digitization standards, accessibility guidelines, and many others. Uh, that's, that's why it should be really accompanied by um, relevant training and programs for the employees of cultural heritage institutions. Um, the process of creation of resources uh, should put also the end users needs uh, first. Actors from different sectors uh, should be involved early uh, in the process of uh, creating those resources. And also relevant uh, research about end users needs to be uh, carried out. Uh, of course, resources uh, should also um, encourage reuse of the materials and enable teachers to uh, create their own uh, educational materials, uh, which uh, meet specific end users' uh, needs. Uh, but also, uh, resources should be engaging, inspiring, enable teachers to provide uh, innovative and activity-based lessons. Uh, our also cross-sectoral, sorry, um, cooperation, creative cooperation between cultural heritage institutions, uh, educational institutions, technology developers, and other actors is very crucial, very important uh, for the creation of really innovative solutions. And our last recommendation uh, is about capacity building uh, for teachers and educators uh, to turn them into competent users and creators of resources. So, um, of course, uh, training for teachers and educators uh, should be provided uh, to enable them, um, most importantly, to fully understand and benefit from the great potential of heritage-based resources. Um, teacher should also um, have the competences and knowledge uh, needed for the effective searching uh, for employment of um, uh, search, uh, effective searching strategies and the knowledge about uh, national and international aggregating platforms, uh, such as, for example, uh, Europeana. Uh, also, actions may aim at uh, making the resources free and available under open licenses or as a public domain, as I already said, it's very important, but there is still a great need for copyright training for teachers and educators, and such training is really crucial for encouraging them to use heritage-based resources broadly and also to fully understand their potential. So I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, now we will discuss the findings and recommendations with our experts. Uh, Maya Drabczyk from Centrum Cyfrowe will be the moderator of the discussion. So uh, Maya, please, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Magda. Thank you uh, for this and a warm welcome, everyone. Uh, good to have you with us. Uh, Magda, if I could just ask you to stop sharing your screen yeah. so get, we could have a proper view of the people. Um, I think you could also, uh, you should appreciate the applause that you're getting in the chat. So, uh, and uh, 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 well deserved, if I may say, coming from the same organization, but a bit from a different angle, looking at the, at the perspective. So what we would like to do now, and still lots of Anahidas with us, this is lovely. I'm going to remember this from today's session. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, uh, we have... Um, uh, two uh, amazing guests with us, our actually not only guests, but our partners in crime when it comes to uh, preparing, conducting and now commenting on the report. And I would like to um, ask you to join me in this together with Magda, uh, uh, who we are, of course, not leaving behind to join me in this uh, in this chat. Welcome, Alicia. Welcome, Isabel. Uh, Alicia uh, Modena is a deputy director of Euroclear, one of our partners. Um, and um, Isabel Crespo. Isabel, you have a super long name at Europeana, but basically she's the right person to reach out to when uh, you need uh, support guidance or uh, any other, um, I don't know, activity related to education uh, area. So uh, hello, everyone. We had one more partner in crime when it comes to the uh, working on the uh, on this research. And that was Brigitte Vezina from Creative Commons. Uh, she unfortunately couldn't join us today, but she will be with us uh, tomorrow at session uh, led by Magda. So this is a warm invitation if you want to uh, have one more deep dive in the theme, um, please uh, join uh, them tomorrow. Uh, um, and also all... Uh, three of you, all three of them, left the comments in the report. I think that the, the link to the, uh, the report is already in the chat, but please don't go there now. Keep it for later. Let's start with the discussion. But I also encourage you to, to really go through not only the, the findings, but also comments provided by Alicia, Isabel, and Brigitte. Uh, they also add a, a brilliant context to, uh, uh, to the findings and recommendations. Okay, so this is enough of me talking. Oh no, one more thing. I want to encourage you all to really use the chat and uh, to ask your questions. We, we really, really want you to be part of this discussion Session with all the limitations that Zoom offers, but the chat is there. We are monitoring it and I'll try to, uh, together with Maria, we'll uh, keep an eye on it and we'll be more than happy to also convey your questions uh, to our guests. Okay, so that was it. I believe that was the final thing. Uh, so jumping on to, to you, um, I wanted to start with a very uh, generic yet relevant question to me. Okay, we have four that's very little uh, recommendations. On the on the other hand, they are very meaty. Uh, do you have a, a one that kind of is the um, um, how to put it uh, that is closest to your heart? That to you is the most relevant one. That is the one that should be kind of you know circled around and be the starting point for uh, for a discussion around the glam uh, being glam materials uh, being used for education purposes. Uh, if I may, Alicia, I would like to begin with you. So, do you have a top one out of four? I, I can you hear me? Here's a whole. Great. Yes, we can. Uh, there's a little bit of echo in this room, which wasn't here earlier, which is interesting, but I'm sure we can make it work. I do have a recommendation that speaks to my heart, actually. And I mean, I know a little bit, you know, I know a little bit you, Maya and Isabel, so it's not going to come as a surprise to you that, uh, among other things at Euroclio, I am professional development coordinator. And so the recommendation that speaks to my heart is number four, the one about capacity building. Um, I don't know how in detail do you want me to go about the why? Uh, please do, please do. Oh, okay. I think yeah, so, we really want to understand the context. Yeah, but. so yeah, I'm at Euroclio, I'm professional development coordinator, but also membership coordinator. And one of the things that I do is I do surveys with our members, History Teachers Association, on what do they need? What do they want us to focus on in the next year? And every time I do a survey, the first thing that comes 
on top of everything else is we want training opportunities. We want to receive high quality training. And the second thing that comes actually is we want access to ready to use source material uh, that we can use in our classroom. So it was very hard to choose a recommendation that would speak to my heart. And yeah, in uh, but also in the list that you made for the operationalization of the recommendation, I see a lot of, uh, of what our members ask. Uh, I see the potential to talk about where to find the sources and just train uh, not only teachers, but also teacher trainers, for example, from my side, on where to find the resources, on how to use them, including copyright. Copyright is very scary for all the teachers that I've ever spoken with, for me as well, actually. So including copyright, but also how to use them to achieve what you want. So if you want to engage students, how to, how to use them to engage students. If you want to develop critical thinking, how to use them to develop critical thinking. And I also see a lot of potential for scaffolding and differentiation. So something that in visual sources, something that teachers that I talk with tell a lot is that they have very diverse classrooms in terms of skills of the students and engaging with sources or using sources in their lesson uh, does help quite a lot uh, in creating activities that are differentiated and so that are more accessible for their students. So yeah, um, this really, really spoke to me uh, a lot. And if I may add just a potential follow up for this recommendation as well is blended learning. So how to use your digital sources in a blended classroom effect. Maybe this could be your next year of research. I don't know. <laughs> well played. <laughs> uh, uh... Thank you very much for this. We'll definitely come back to the uh, the topic of capacity building, but um, I would like to now move on to Isabel and your initial thoughts. First of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting us and uh, make possible to bring uh, kind of the vision of Europeana and Europeana Network, uh, not the staff uh, vision, but uh, all the professionals that are behind uh, this initiative. Uh, to a forum like this, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, we have uh, colleagues from non-formal education, from CNCHIs, but also uh, from uh, teachers. Um, I'm not going to be very original here, so I'm going to really join uh, Alice's um, uh, preference because uh, Actually, I always, uh, it's always in my mind that education is uh, the foundation for almost everything. So uh, what could be better than uh, educate the educators, train the trainers to be the capable to, you know, to transfer all this knowledge to, to the students, you know, which are the, the main important target group here. So, and this research actually uh, shows what happens when teachers are equipped. No, we see how uh, when a teacher has uh, enough knowledge to find digital content and use it in a negative way, they go back and they use regularly these uh, this, uh, this materials. They feel they are um, bringing a more innovative, engaging uh, 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 lesson to their, to their pupils. Um, and they, they become also, this is also something that I found it uh, uh, Magnificent that uh, this uh, research shows how they can become curators, producers of their own uh, of their own content. No? And there are many other competence factors related to that. And that's the need for personalized uh, teaching. Uh, you cannot. Uh, you, there are more um, demand on uh, uh, student-centered approaches and, uh, and go uh, case by case. But okay, this is another conversation. But. Um, uh, we had this pool of teachers that we surveyed that, that come from these uh, networks, people that they are used to uh, introduce the technologies, uh, search for this content into their practice. Uh, but the other side of the spectrum, and this is the majority of teachers yet, that um, they, are, they are not well equipped yet. And um, we've seen in our um, research, our study research, how uh, demographic shows that uh, the average teacher is a woman in their 50s with 20, 30 years of ex expertise. So a lot of experience, a lot of uh, uh, background uh, knowledge to offer, but they never had the chance to upskill, reskill themselves uh, and introduce uh, digital technologies, digital content. Because one thing is to search for digital content. And another thing oh, is... Yes. <laughs> No, 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 no. That's, that's fantastic. So one thing is to is to have this digital content. Another thing is how to use it uh, for for um, implement uh, 
pedagogies or, or innovative um, methodologies. And uh, what we see in our, uh, when we provide, and I'm sure that Alicia has the same experience, when we provide this, uh, in our case, Europeana, massive online courses, training opportunities, the, the, how the, the user, or the, the professional evolved in, in, in their learning. So they feel more confident in the use of uh, copyright uh, uh, license, uh, more confident on how to integrate uh, digital culture into their practice. So there's, there's a clear uh, benefit uh, of, of pursuing uh, uh, this kind of uh, more production of, of learning materials by, by CHIs and, and institutions like uh, Euroclio, Europeana, Wikimedia. So I think, um, I think that that was the most important uh, recommendation for me, and probably the rest uh, will follow. Uh, they are intertwined, of course, but uh, uh, they will trigger the rest of of, uh, of uh, um, desired effects. Let's say. Okay, thank you very much. You touched upon uh, many very relevant points that I will try to come back to. I see on my screen that I'm disappearing because of the sun behind me. So apologies for that, but I'm not going to complain of the sun factor because uh, we are getting less and less of it in Warsaw. So apologies for this uh, bit of a, um, yeah, a malfunction on my side, but, um, uh, but okay, uh, let's leave it as it is. Uh, Magda, the same question. To you. I know it's super hard to reply as an author, the main author of the of the research, but perhaps you have a a a I don't want to say favorite, but a, a a recommendation that kind of comes to you or has a, a biggest potential or um, is the most relevant one, the one that you would like to stress. Yeah, thank you, Maya. Uh, I will be very brief. <laughs> I don't want to take time from our partners. Uh, and I think, um, of course, there are so many recommendations that are really uh, at my uh, near to my heart now after conducting this research. But uh, maybe I will focus on the one um, connect, uh, connecting uh, connected with copyright uh, legal status of those resources because uh, also uh, during the interviews uh, this was uh, mentioned as a really big problem uh, for uh, for teachers and educators uh, they were really lost they told me a lot of stories about uh, how they are don't know this legal status of those resources uh, they don't know in which um, circumstances uh, they can use it so uh this uh i think it's really like um maybe quite easy to implement i mean this resources about of course um about uh uh, uh clearly labeled easy to find and user friendly right right statements of course because uh, the second part of the recommendation is much harder to implement uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, the life of our teachers and, uh, and educators um, would be much easier with those clearly state, uh, right, stated rights, uh, copyrights. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for this. I think this one is very much connected to the capacity building because you also need to understand what you are reading. So you need to understand the labels properly. So um, of course, one thing is to really uh, bear in mind being a cultural heritage institutions, having a um, online space, um, providing access to different resources or collections or simply digital items. So the one, one thing, yes, that's very true. Make those uh, clear um, labels um uh, publish them make them um clearly available and the other thing is the understanding of what you're reading and this is this is us coming back to the capacity building definitely um i very much agree with the point on capacity building the need um the need uh, to understand better and the point that uh, isabel made that in the end it's all about educating and uh, yes uh, educating also the uh, the educators but I wanted to come back to two elements that I also got from uh, from your interventions. The first one uh, is about the uh, 
kind of, to me, active participation, not only uh, use of existing materials, but really the creation on your own. So uh, we, we have in the report, we have examples, proofs showing that there is interest, that there's maybe not enough knowledge and uh, um, in like, encouraging teachers, educators to, um, to really turn into creators of um, educational resources. This is something you mentioned, Alicia, this is something also you, um, you brought up, uh, Isabel. How can we change that? Thinking like we are on a, uh, in a uh, open education policy forum, what needs to change on a policy level, on a strategy level uh, to, to try to uh, turn um, this, um, okay, let's let's call it uh, passive. Use not not really passive, but okay to turn the uh, the the educators from users into creators. Let's put it like that, to encourage them more to really make the most of the of the potential and the vast of uh, sources that uh, the um, CHIs have to offer, cultural heritage institutions have to offer. I don't know, Isabel, would you like to begin? Uh, I think it always goes back to the same, uh, to the root of, of uh, um, equip and uh, train and uh, let teachers know where to find the materials and uh, how to use them into the classroom in a, in a way that um, provides this interaction with, with the students. And when to use these this digital technologies, yeah? because also blended learning was, was mentioned, it's not just about uh, digital environment and uh, digital interaction. You can also digital, use this digital tools into the classroom with your teacher next to you uh, to create more engaging experiences. Um, I think um, Institutions, cultural heritage institutions are uh, great uh, content holders uh, of the material and they need uh, to work, uh, and this is mentioned uh, constantly in, in the research, you know, this, uh, the importance of this cross cooperation between, uh, between uh, uh, institutions and uh, uh, developers uh, to create uh, and, and understand the user needs to create uh, services and products that are fit for purpose. And uh, one of the elements that we observe in, uh, in, in partnership with, uh, with uh, Central Cipro, uh, with uh, Euroclio, in other projects that we are running, um, is to, to really create uh, tools that are, uh, they serve uh, a learning goal, they, they serve the teacher in, in, the, in their objectives. So it's, um, until now, we've seen many uh, learning products, like digital learning products that are kind of uh, flat, uh, just consumption of images, just consumption of materials without facilitating this, this exchange of uh, opinions, ideas between the teacher and the, and the student. And I think Alice now will tell us more about that because Historiana, sorry, but the, it's, it's like a... I have to. I have to tell you, uh, it's it's a fantastic platform that facilitates actually this kind of uh, interaction. It's a work in progress uh, tool. Uh, it's a platform that has been developed for many years. It's going to be developed in the coming, uh, but uh, always with this um, outside in uh, approach. First, to understand what the teachers need, uh, listen what the students uh, uh, also uh, require put these things together and discuss with developers, discuss with content providers, discuss with the European network, how to build the best, uh, the best uh, resource or the best platform. And Historiana is one example of this. And uh, slowly, best steady, they are including features that uh, uh, facilitate this interaction. And uh, I I'm sure that uh, Alice can offer much more details uh, about that. Yeah. Thanks, Isabel. Alice, could you tell us more indeed about your method? So how do you turn uh, educators into creators and how you facilitate this cross-sectoral dialogue, which is, um, yeah, also from my own um, experience, uh, it is still a bit of a challenge. We still sometimes speak different languages. Yeah, no, we definitely speak different languages. And um, I think that what has worked for us is we bring people around the same table, people that care about the same topic. So I've been working at Euroclio for about four years and a half now, and I've been working on four different projects that 
focused on very, very different topics, but they all had ultimately at their heart uh, promoting the development of quality educational material to uh, promote the development in students of civil competences. And we did it from the angle of football history. And, we, and so we got together around the same table teachers and, and, member, and cultural heritage professionals that were interested in the history of football and in using this history as a door opener uh, to, to engage students. Or we had a project about learning to disagree and that was all about teachers that wanted to learn how to teach about controversial issues and or about inclusive education. You know, there's many examples here. Um, and by finding this first opening in something that is dear to the teacher's heart, um, we could find, yeah, the, the, we could tap into this passion. And then from there, uh, I mean, Isabel already said it all. We, we always start from research, from the research of what does the teacher need and who has this um, knowledge that the teachers need or who has this tool that the teacher needs. And then from there, we would develop the material and make it available on Historiana, which for those who are connected and know it is uh, an e-learning platform that among other things contains curated content, curated exemplary learning activities, but also gives teachers the tool to develop their own e-learning activities. Um, in terms of dialogue with, uh, with I call them the non-teacher players, so with cultural heritage professionals, um, I think that that is also very much driven on passion. It's much easier, uh, in my experience, to engage in this dialogue with uh, cultural heritage institutes that are already part of Europeana, that are already part of a global community, of a, sorry, a Europe-wide community. Um, and what I think works very well is when you bring together uh, the cultural heritage professional and the teachers uh, to develop something together. So in, uh, well, actually in the spring of 2022, it's fairly new as well, we have started organizing meetings where we would bring together uh, collection holders, so people that have access to high, high, high quality digital material, digital sources that are already open uh, and can be used for educational use. And we would bring them together to the teachers that have access to the students and that can test whether or not this activity work. And they together developed a series of activities that uh, will now be tested in the classroom, will now be used in the classroom, but that, that is of a high quality and that the cultural heritage professionals know teachers will use. Because I don't want to put words in the mouth of cultural heritage professionals, but the impression that I have is that, of course, you prefer to invest your time into something that you know will be used, that you know that it will be useful. And some professionals in the cultural heritage sector maybe were teachers before and some were not. And so access to, um, to teachers is also something that I think it's very valuable. I also wanted to mention, because you mentioned policy, I think that uh, something that also can promote the creation of teacher-led material, the creation of their own material is time. Uh, teachers' timetable is always quite packed and developing educational material getting training, joining networking events, they all require time. So uh, I am sure it always comes up, but I think that uh, freeing some time for the teachers so that they can actually develop the material, uh, easing a little bit the curriculum constraints that some teachers have uh, on what they teach, how they teach, how long they do teach it, will ultimately yeah, yeah, give access to more networking events, to more trainings, and give them the actual time to develop the activities. Okay, thank you very much for this. Um, we've been talking about the the creation, but I would like to come back to like to turning educators really into active, uh, active creators and users of the uh, GLAM content for education purposes. But I would like to come back to one of uh, Magda's initial slides. Um, this is actually data coming from our previous uh, research at Centrum uh, showing that 38% of teachers during the, uh, the, the remote education um, uh, during the pandemic uh, were using uh, GLAM-based or GLAM-created educational resources. You can say it's a lot. You can also differ and say, oh, just 38%. Again, how can we, I know it's a, it's a big question, 
But um, again, coming back to the policy level, we've been talking a lot about the capacity building, the need for dialogue. What else should we add and, and copyright, right? Uh, what else should we add to this list of themes that should be discussed on a kind of the policy strategy level in order to change this number, in order to uh, make more um, educators, more teachers interested in the variety of resources that GLAM has to offer. <laughs> but have we list them all so far? Yeah. Is the question addressed to anyone or we can just jump in? Jump in. Yeah. Jump oh. in, Isabel. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, I mean, uh, um, uh, I think one, one of the things, I'm going to start a bit different. I'm going to um, take another uh, point of view. Uh, um, in, in the research, one of the things that uh, struck me the most was that uh, uh, teachers declare that most of these resources were dispersed. And they, they said this like a disadvantage. But for me, uh, I was just struggling and trying to understand um, the rationale here behind. But I thought, um, um, considering uh, how difficult for one unique platform to please all the, um, the user group uh, functionalities, requirements, um, it's, it's almost impossible to, to really uh, reach all the European, in, in the case of Europeana, we should cover all the age groups, all the national curricula. So that's, that's really impossible. Um, that's why I think uh, now that we know the importance of having these uh, resources created, developed by cultural health institutions uh, with open, open licenses, um, it's it's fundamental because uh, they are closer to the to uh, specific uh, educational communities. They can offer the the materials in their own language. Um, that's really uh, um, uh, I think uh, the benefit of having this uh, material dispersed in the territory in uh, among all these uh, cultural heritage institutions and. Um, it, it needs to be like that. Uh, maybe the role of Europeana or institutions like Clio, Wikimedia, is to be the connectors. We are in this uh, unique position of having uh, in our network uh, a variety of professionals, like this content holders, CHS professionals, but also the, the educators, uh, even uh, techie people, developers. So we can connect these uh, great minds uh, uh, and knowledge for bringing it to the, the closer communities, the, 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 the educational communities of your city, of a region, of your country, and to bring this expertise and, and start to develop this, um, uh, these materials. Um, I don't know, I, I think I've lost a bit the, the initial question, uh, Maya. Uh, I, had, I had an argument here, but... <laughs> I the don't... initial one was how to make the group grow, how to make the, the users, uh, the educators use more um, uh, GLAM-based educational uh, resources and also co-create them. Yes, that, that's, that, thank you very much. That's why I, <laughs> my point was actually to be dispersed is not a disadvantage. I think it, is, it per se is something good that everybody could have a close access uh, to these materials. Uh, what we really need is to raise the awareness of these materials, uh, be able to communicate better these materials. I don't know if at poly we know that uh, the European Commission is designing this uh, big hub, big co education community that maybe in the future will be able to, to bring those resources uh, developed by, by this um, uh, ecosystem not of uh, formal education, but also from, uh, from uh, CHIs and non-formal educators. So hopefully this could be a place where every educator, even every any student could go there and find out uh, where to find the, the resources uh, for open uh, licensed uh, resources. 
Uh, but also going back, it's, it's interesting because uh, one of the ways uh, the, so the participants in the survey um, try to find content was going to the CHI's websites. So I thought, okay, they found it dispersed, but they still go there, so they know where to go. Uh, so maybe perhaps CHI's, they need to, be, to make more relevant these materials or, or, or bring more materials, uh, try to understand what the school nearby they need, which are the curricular topics, how we can use our content and create something useful for them. Uh, so communication, 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 I think this is something that we should put uh, more emphasis. Mm -hmm. uh, Magda, I see you're uh, nodding. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add here? Yeah, it's, it's just I couldn't agree more. I agree so so much with uh, Isabel, and um, um, uh, I just uh, I won't be or original, but I think that uh, we need to first of all uh, training is very very uh, important. Um, and providing the knowledge where to search those materials. Uh, as Isabel uh, said, uh, the, the huge dispersion is not really a great problem, but the knowledge wh when to search, wh where to search, how to search, when uh, about uh, the, the cu different cultural heritage institutions and the resources, it's really like, crucial, necessary, because otherwise it's really hard work for teachers. Um, it uh, comes from the interviews and uh, they need, they, uh, they wait for ways to, for example, for the catalog of those resources or those uh, institutions when we can find, uh, when they can find those resources. So uh, I couldn't agree more. I don't think it's it, the, the dispersion is disadvantage, but uh, we need to think about the training, about how to and when to, uh, where to search, uh, search for these materials. And I also agree with the voice from the chat. Uh, I think it was Leo. Um, the um, uh, the fact that those resources are put uh, on the website of cultural heritage institutions meet all, uh, means also that they are very um, you know credible. I mean uh, you know searching via uh, Google for example, which as we can see from the uh, from the statistics from the study, it's uh, the most popular searching strategies strategy. Uh, you know, can give you uh, many different, uh, not reliable uh, resources. Um, so um, yeah, I, 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 I agree that this is not a disadvantage, but we really need to take care to, uh, of, um, of our teachers and educators and provide them with something, I think. Uh, something which uh, will, um, will, uh, will do those, uh, the, the, the searching for those materials easier. You know, um, mm -hmm. so, so the need for guidance. Idea. I think we are again circling yeah. back to the need of being in dialogue and being connected, and uh, CHI is offering guidance, but also I think really both um, both partners, both stakeholders, are really trying to understand what the other side has to offer, can offer, and what the needs are. Right. So it's not only the, the needs of the the end users, let's call them pupils, students but the educators themselves. Um, thank you very much, Magda. Thank you also for mentioning the chat. And I wanted to touch base with uh, Maria now, whether, uh, because I see the chat scrolling down, so messages uh, popping up. Uh, is there uh, anything, um, so I'm sure there is plenty, but uh, could we pick something yes, for, for of the panel? There mm -hmm. was a, a, uh, the discussion, uh, uh, parallel to the, to your talk, but um, there is one question actually, uh, which is uh, I think very important, and um, uh, it's about the risk of open copyright and um, the disinformation, which is uh, also not only uh, connected to open copyright, but it is uh, going on in the internet uh, in general. So the question is how to reveal and remove Russian propaganda spreading cultural and academic organizations and not let them use these innovations and multiply their fake research on digital cultural heritage using the knowledge on uh, open copyright. So this is also an open question. Uh, mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alicia, yes, please. 
I think that partially the answer was already given actually. And it's, um, it's something that has been said by both Isabel and Magda about how um, communication is key, but also communications, um, I, I was thinking a little bit about also communication among the platforms. So um, we can give reliability to, to each other, you know, it's we can uh, look at a source and and together see uh, e whether a source is reliable or not. Of course, it's not the best and the cleanest of solutions, and it requires us to have good media literacy and uh, and yeah, media resilience competences ourselves. But in part, uh, the sharing of resources uh, within the platforms. Uh, I was also thinking, you know. Um, putting on our platform references to other platforms so that uh, once you find one, you found all of them, if platforms are dispersed, for example, could already get us started to, um, to counter a little bit the risk of fake news. Last year, we hosted a webinar series on fake news and propaganda and uh, yeah, communication. You know, the, the first thing that they tell you on whether or on how to check whether a news is fake or not is it has that been shared by multiple news outlets and that's what we can do ourselves as well when it comes to resources to visit to, to visual resources it's not easy and it requires a lot of time and a lot of investment uh, but that's I think uh, the first avenue to take Mm -hmm. So it's rather not about uh, stopping someone from sharing something in the first place, but really it's about being able to verify and being connected to the others. And uh, um, I think coming back also to something that Magda said, being this trustworthy source yeah, yes, exactly. and the kind of trustworthy point of reference. I think I, I fully agree that this is the weapon, so to say, um, um, very bad choice of words here. But uh, but I think this is it. Um, I don't know, Isabel, Magda, would you like to add to this? I, uh, I fully agree it's relevant. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with, with you all. I mean, um, we have a new learning paradigm. So we, we all know that it's not about... Um, uh, um, having a lot of uh, data, information, memorize all of this. The, the teacher needs to, to become a cultural mediator, a coach, an advisor, someone that gives you strategies. And one of those strategies is to critically think about uh, this kind of messages and, and information online. So um, I, I keep in my mind one of the um, uh, um, speeches that uh, Steven Sticher, who is the director of, of Euroclio, uh, had in, in a conference in Russia. It was it was wonderful because uh, one of the last words was, um, we don't need to, um, to teach uh, students what to think, but how to think. And this is uh, the main role nowadays. Uh, we cannot uh, stop uh, digital developments anymore, but we can uh, give uh, antidotes no, to, for the students on how to analyze these materials, where to go and uh, contrast information. Have also multi-perspectivity eh, because, and I think this is the wonderful um, uh, uh, components, elements of having access to an array of uh, resources from all over the world, no? also to, to contrast uh, specific narratives. Uh, uh, so I think that's basically one of the main missions nowadays in, in education. So I, I fully, fully agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, Magda, any final thoughts? No, I'm not original. I just uh, fully agree with Isabel and Alice in this uh, in this subject. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think so. Um, uh, Maria, do we have more questions from the chat or comments? Uh, mm, we I didn't catch any more questions. Uh, so um, this is the time you can uh, add. One, if you want, uh, anybody of you. But uh, there, there were a lot of comments. Uh, but <laughs> I okay. think the discussion also were, yeah, we're continuing on chat. Okay, so thank you very much for this. I think we will. Uh, we need to slowly uh, wrap up, but I think we are uh, wrapping up uh, on a very high note and rightfully so, and really showing the value of sources, showing the, the value of trustworthy sources. And these definitely can be offered and are offered, maybe not as much as we still would like them to, but you know, this is changing, this is work in progress, 
so offered by CHIs. CHIs opening up for education. Uh, CHIs opening up their vaults uh, for uh, for educators, for teachers, allowing them or inviting them. Uh, I think that's a better word to to really make use of the, uh, of their collections. Um, and uh, yeah, the 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 time is uh, is now to to use these collections to really uh, teach about. Yeah, we, we named many, but starting from media literacy and the, the value of critical thinking, I think uh, definitely yes. So um, this is a bit of a call to action. Go uh, to all the educators here and the CHI's professionals. Um, try to find your uh, counterpartner. Try to um, make these collaborations work. They might be tricky, of course, but there is a definitely a value uh, in it. We're gonna hear about more of the examples of the value, uh, I think in a quarter, when we're gonna introduce a number of speakers to you all uh, during the lightning talks. So please join us. Uh, but, uh, but for now, I just wanted to say a big thank you uh, to the three of you, to Magda, Alice, Isabel. Magda, congratulations again on the on the research. I think we still want to hear from you all. Um, so we will create a sp space for, for feedback. We want to really uh, hear your thoughts on the research case studies that can support the findings and the recommendations. We are very open uh, to gather them. So uh, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, I think all the necessary information are on our website and the link uh, exactly. Thank you, Maria. She just shared it again. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this. And uh, Anahida, I believe the floor yes. is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much um, for this uh, very fruitful discussion. And uh, we need to, I think, settle down with all that fascinating data. So uh, we will take uh, a very short break. But before that, um, I have a little um, announcement. Um, so to have you all here, we just wanted to uh, let you know that we are working on the project called Watching Videos Like Historian uh, together with Euroclea and Europana. Um, and it's focused on the series of the activities built around media education supported by audiovisual materials. And the main objective of the project is to empower and equip educators to use audiovisual materials to teach media literacy in order to turn they students in uh, into conscious and criti uh, and critical citizens. So, what we want to ask uh, is for you to contribute to the report by filling in the survey and sharing your experience on how audiovisual materials are used for education. And um, you will find in a chat the link to that. Uh, so, please. Um, uh, please go there and um, we are also interested in two perspectives. It's media literacy teachers and education perspective and out of visual collections holders perspective. So the links are there. Um, please share your insight with us and thanks um, in advance for your support. Let's take a break. And after 10 minutes, uh, we will come back to you. I think it will be like five let's say 30, uh, we're gonna come back to you with lightning talk session. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. So uh, welcome back and hello uh, to everyone joining us uh, just now. Uh, welcome to the um, Open Education Policy Forum. Uh, we are about to begin the uh, lightning talk session. This is a space where we um, open up and give a chance to our colleagues, esteemed colleagues from different fields and different areas of the world to share their experience uh, with us and with you all. And uh, we... Uh, as it is a lightning talk session, uh, we of course have um, time limitations and it is my um, sad duty to be the timekeeper here. And um, so I'm, I'm just gonna time you guys <laughs> and you're gonna hear my uh, my alarm at, at my phone. Uh, but as, and this comes as an announcement, we've um, sadly on a very last minute, uh, due to personal reasons, we lost one of the speakers. So um, Veronica won't be able to join us uh, today. 
this means that the other four get an extra minute. So <laughs> this is how generous we can be today. Um, again, uh, a bit repeating um, uh, what uh, Anna Hida has just shared is that we really uh, want to, even though this is a very short and snappy uh, format, uh, we still would like to find room uh, an opportunity for questions or at least a question. And uh, I really encourage you all uh, to share your uh, questions in the chat and I will be happy to uh to to ask them uh to the uh, presenters uh okay uh without further ado um i would like to introduce or give the floor to the first speakers and uh, natalia walter the floor is yours so uh, please set up we ask the presenters just to introduce the setting uh to share their own uh presentations to feel comfortable uh, with operating the slides so Okay, uh, I think everything is okay. Uh, everything is fine. Yeah. Okay, okay. Natalia, well, ready to go? I'm pressing start then. Uh, yeah, let's <laughs> no start. Pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. Okay, let's start. Uh, in the early days of COVID-19 pandemic, teachers felt overwhelmed by the digital world, where they had never be before had to navigate such an area. The pressure and sense of duty caused several concerns about conducting online lessons. Numerous studies have talked about it, uh, including, sorry, I've got, of course, problems with my presentation, uh, including those by, run by uh, Centrum Cyfrowe also. Uh, in addition, teachers often didn't not use technology before pandemic because many feared the negative effects of using digital media by children. We also know that empirical evidence on the impact of using ICT for educa ed educational purposes and improving student performance is still sparse and the results are mixed. So initially, teachers focused on improving digital, I can say technical or operational competences. Uh, that is uh, the ability to use digital media as teaching tools, how to use an e-learning platforms, for example. Uh, research has shown that this stage happened quickly and teachers uh, began to be relatively comfortable with e-learning technologies in the first few months. Uh, okay. With time, it became clear that conducting online lessons it's not only about the tool and organizational issue, but also about teaching and caring for relationships in the classroom. So they began to exchange information and look for solutions, but it all overwhelmed them all the time. Uh, when, uh, um, not so fast, uh, the keyword in the pandemic has become well-being. Also, digital well-being, that is a kind of balance between one's sense of comfort and happiness and the expectation of the environment, professional burdens, or does digital overload. Uh, when I ask teachers which of these photos is related to their sense of well-being, no one pointed to photo number three. And yet, in the online world, we also need to develop such well-being. When we think about well-being, also digital well-being, we take into account four of its main aspects. Psychological, emotional, a kind of happiness, physical, good health, physical condition, social, but also cognitive with uh, self problems. So the teachers started looking for help to find a balance in these four areas. One of the forms of uh, emergency, emergency support in human life, uh, such emergency situation was, for example, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one of the forms has become online social support. It took the form of emotional support, for example, teacher groups on social media, instrumental and informative, uh, how to conduct online lessons, as well as tangible and belonging support. I am a part of a uh, teacher's group. Nobody knows what to do. The pandemic uh, and remote education have proved to teachers that it is worth cooperating with each other. It enabled contact between people from different parts of Poland of world. 
uh, and the exchange of experiences, many inspiring teaching projects have been created, such as invite me to your lesson, uh, where some teachers invite others to their lessons. Uh, teachers also gained opportunities for self-development and access to numerous resources that facilitate remote improvement of competences. Educators living in small towns, distant from large professional development centers, especially appreciated this. Thus, webinars and e-learning courses have become forms of online social support. Examples include MOOCs different word, massive open online courses, which are generally available and free. Uh, in the night, uh, 2019, uh, we, we uh, Adam Mickiewicz University team, uh, initiated the project uh, in Polish is wzmocnij uh, swoje kompetencje, we can say strengthen your competences, which consisted in creating two MOOCs for teachers. One of them was the use of information and communication technologies in the teacher's work, and I will focus on that course. And the second, uh, success is not co uh, coincidence, uh, I will not tell about it. Uh, what is important, we finished developing the courses in April 2020. So <laughs> their onset coincided with the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown. The teachers began to take part in the course en masse, and their interest exceeded our wildest expectations. Almost 3,000 people took part in the first edition of the course. Uh, we've got now third edition and still many part participants, but not so many as uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I remember the evening before the course uh, was launched, I quickly supplemented it with e-learning content to best support teachers during a pandemic. Uh, the course um, consisted of 12 modules. I will not uh, read that, but some of them, promotion of educational institutions, online collaboration, tools to improve the teacher's work, uh, for what else, programming and algorithm, uh, reliability um, with uh, you know, uh, fake news, uh, copyright, and so on. Uh, and the last one was a um, module with uh, webinars uh, about online youth activity for social involvement, cyber threats, and educational challenges. Uh, finally, we asked uh, our participants if they would recommend our course to others. Uh, it was, I think, important. And you can see the green and blue uh, poll. It's yes and rather yes. Almost 100 uh, participants said uh, they would recommend our course to others. And contrary to appearance, the internet is based on empathic behavior, supportive behavior, and cooperation. The pandemic has shown that it is worth sharing your knowledge and experience on the internet and building open educational resources. And MOOC. It's one of the examples of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you very much for also being, uh, you know, under the time limits so with this extra minute uh, served you well. Um, I have a question. Uh, I believe so. If I got it correctly, the MOOC is available in Poland, right? This is it's it's crafted for uh, Polish educators and. Um, is it a, a completed task or is it something that um, for our Polish um, audience, uh, is it an ongoing um, program, something that you can still, um, you know, uh, sign up to and uh, um, do the course? Yeah, uh, it's still open. Uh, we think we, we, we've got now a third edition, but I think we, we will have uh, the, the, the next one. Uh, but uh, I would like to introduce you to the old platform. It's, it's called uh, Navojka. Uh, it, it was named of first Polish student, girl student, female student. Uh, by the way, uh, there is a lot of courses, MOOC, MOOCs uh, on the platform for teachers, for everybody, and uh, everybody can take part for free 
uh, the, the moment when uh, he wants to, to, to interact and to learn. Okay, thank you, Marge. If I can ask you to share all the uh, the links uh, in the chat, that would yeah. be very useful. Thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, okay, um, let's keep this going. Uh, Leo, um, are you with us here? So, hello, I am. Hel here. Yes. Hi, Maya. Hello, Leo. Nice uh, to uh, nice to see you too, uh, Leo from the Open University. Uh, you have your eight minutes. Thank you very much. I'm going to wait till you uh, set up, don't worry. <laughs> okay, uh, I think you should see my uh, my slides now. It's positive, go for Great. it. Great, okay. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for having me once again at the Open Education Policy Forum. Um, I love being a regular contributor at this event. It's uh, always uh, very fascinating and uh, great to connect with this group of people. And, um, I, as, as you can see on my slide, um, I am at the Open University where I'm a doctoral researcher, but I'm also, I also work at University College London um, as a program development advisor. But this uh, presentation is more about my, um, about my research. Um, so uh, my research is very much based in open education and, um, and by this I mean in a wide sense, um, we're talking about um, forms of education that are aiming to increase educational access, effectiveness and equity through fostering participation and knowledge co-creation. And, um, and one of the points that I think is quite important to bear in mind is that open education has had a long pre-digital history um, before we came into the, the kind of the current world where um, most of the things that we try to do now, we kind of try to do digitally. And so open education has also transformed, been digitally transformed, but it, it was, for example, through open universities and other such uh, methods, we were trying to open up education before we were never necessarily talking about online and before we were necessarily talking about um, about OER, although that's now become a very significant element, as we know, of open education. So then open education policies, as opposed to just OER policies, which a lot of the um, a lot of the research focuses very closely on that. Um, uh, open education policies in a wider sense um, can be understood. This is a, a definition that I co-wrote with some, um, some other authors um, The references will, will follow. Um, it can be understood as written or unwritten guidelines, regulations and strategies which seek to foster the development and implementation of open educational practices, including the creation and use of open educational resources. Um, sorry, I'm trying not to talk too fast, but at the same time, I know I don't have very long. <laughs> so, and um, so what I'm thinking is that the with these um, policies, um, it's important to bear in mind that this is how um, governments, institutions and organizations are allocating resources and orchestrating activities um, in this in the service of opening up education. And so a lot of this is about unlocking resources for things to happen. So thinking about um, the, um, I, should, I should stress also that I'm quite focused on higher education, as you might have guessed from where, where I'm studying and where I'm working. So this is a bit of a higher education um, uh, kind of um, lens on this. Um, when, um, so when we're thinking about this, um, about open education policies as a kind of a pyramid or as kind of in layers, um, we've proposed thinking about the supranational level as actually the foundation on which it all sits and in a way the vision statement. Um, national educational strategies as being all about how um, the, um, the, the individual kind of um, country is looking to allocate resources specifically. So that's really the kind of the, 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 the level at which it's possible that funding might be able to be unlocked um, to go towards these kind of activities. And then institutional policy priorities, and of course, this could also be talking about about school systems or about organizations or uh, other other uh, kind of smaller units. Here, I'm thinking mostly about higher education institutions, and that's where, where my research is looking. Um, in terms of higher education institutions, these are a very diverse group um, of organizations. Um, uh, this is where the teaching and learning is occurring. Um, this is where policies are put into practice, the policies that are kind of flowing from these other um, layers. Um, so so the, the institutions um, may be inspired by the vision 
from the super supranational level. They may be needing to comply with various kinds of national policies that might be more regulatory, or they might be able to tap into um, money that national policy has um, made available. Um, but also in, at the institutional level, there is an enormous amount of flexibility in terms of creating internal policies um, and in the practices and priorities even of individual staff members, which is why it's quite um, an interesting area that still is hard to know everything about. Uh, so in my um, study that I'm working on, um, it's um, about valuing open in higher education institutions. Um, it's, it's investigating institutional policies for openness and education as texts, so in other words, as a kind of a document that is what the institution is saying about it, um, also as actions in terms of what they are doing about it, so that's kind of referring back to that idea of policy could also be unwritten as well as written, it could be more implicit in this is what um, funding is allocated towards, this, maybe we have a person with this job title that deals with this thing. You know, these are not necessarily that there's a written policy, but we see the institution is doing something in that in that realm. And um, and also um, thinking about um, policy as um, as a process as well as as a as a kind of a, a product. Uh, so in terms of who is making policy and how is it being made. And I'm going to investigate these through um, looking at policy documents um, through. Um, surveying stakeholders, which is what I'm going to discuss a little bit next, um, and also through interviewing policy makers. So the surveying um, is now mostly complete. And, um, and here's some, some really quick headlines from what I found from my survey. It's been a global survey, hence why I'm here with the, the whole world. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's uh, obviously um, you know, difficult to reach all the corners of the globe, but I've worked really hard to get a kind of a wide ranging sample. I'm really um, pleased with the, the um, range. Um, so OER is probably the most well supported form of open education activity that's coming through in the survey. Even so, it depends on the institution. In many places, there wasn't a lot of real institutional support and it was more about committed individuals being involved. So this isn't really that surprising, but this is showing us there is still work to do there. Um, there is support for MOOCs and open or kind of lower cost courses, which I'm kind of regarding as something that's kind of grown out of the open education movement. So I have asked about this in the survey as well. And there's definitely mention of micro credentials um, coming through in the survey as a kind of emerging area that a lot of institutions are looking, looking at at the moment. In terms of some of these other, other open practices like open teaching, learning and assessment practices, engagement with um, Wikimedia services um, and participation in open communities of practice. Um, these, it seems, are not very much discussed in explicit policies in institutions currently. Um, and it seems that there's also a bit of lack of recognition and reward for engaging in these kind of activities. But there does tend to be some support available from staff with expertise for those that are looking to do these things. So that's encouraging, but I think still some, some work to do there to get, get those practices more recognized as being good practice and more supported and more kind of prioritized and some recognition for those who are doing them. So another area that I thought would be of great interest to this group was copyright. And I asked about who owns the copyright of the resources that um, staff members working in higher education institutions create. And um, we've got um, the copyright is um, the, the author owns the copyright of any works that, that they've produced, whether it's for research or for education, was um, a big, a big chunk. The institution generally owns the copyright um, was another big chunk. Um, employees own the copyright in their own works, whether it's for Oh, sorry, the institution generally owns the copyright of works, but research isn't exempted was another big chunk. Employees own the copyright, whether it's research or education um, work. Um, and then the copyright ownership also can depend on the employee roles. So in other words, if you're an academic, you tend to, might, in this case, you might tend to retain your ownership. If you're a kind of a staff member that works in kind of a more of a support role in the institution, it might tend that the institution is going to own your intellectual property, apparently. Um, and also a big chunk of people said, this is unclear or unknown to me. Um, and but as you can see, very uh, big pieces of pie for all of those answers. So it's very different depending where you are. 
And the ownership status of the resources aside, um, the biggest um, uh, result was that staff are neither encouraged nor discouraged from releasing them as OER. Um, so I thought that was an interesting finding as well. Uh, but there is definitely a big proportion where there is some encouragement to um, license and release resources. So that was good to see. Um, the last bit I wanted to mention was about the, um, the pandemic. And obviously I thought this would be of great interest to this group as well. Um, definitely very mixed finding into findings I've found so far in terms of uh, pandemic impact on open education policy in institutions. So some people saying, I'm not sure it has really made very much difference. Um, our institutional response was focused on using tools, not so much about um, open pedagogy, um, but also some um, promising signs like it's definitely increased awareness of open resources and practices. Um, we have a positive shift towards OEP, not policy, but teaching and learning community overall, um, or an interest in OER as a byproduct of the difficulties in providing access to the commercial educational materials that were previously assigned. Certainly in the UK, this has been a huge issue and led to the um, hashtag ebook SOS campaign that some of you may already be aware of. And, um, and this continues to be a, a huge problem where commercial resources have become um, prohibitively expensive. And so uh, thank you very much. I will leave it there. I hope I haven't gone on too long. Thanks, Maya. <laughs> Thanks, Leah, just a little bit, but it was super uh, interesting. And thank you for sharing data. Uh, a super brief question from me. When can we expect the, the final report? So what can we expect you to have? That's a good question. Um, the the um, What I will try to do is produce um, more of a, um, a, a longer paper um, based on the survey results and then the, the overall project is going to be ongoing still for a while and mm -hmm. eventually there will be a um, a kind of a, um, a thesis um, and um, and then um, you know ultimately some more um, hopefully some more research outputs arising but this is very much our first first look at the findings today no but it's uh, it's already um, very interesting and I, I'm, I'm scrolling through the chat and many of us would love to if if already possible, we would love to to have access and of course your comments, read your comments, your um, evaluation of this study. But there is one more question I, have, um, I would like to uh, ask from the chat and it's from uh, Werner uh, Bestemann uh, and the, apart from regards, uh, the, the question is, do you see differences within higher education open policies related to lifelong learning institutions? Uh, is there or should be there an open uh, open policies for informal um, for informal non formal educational institutions or initiatives? I mean, I I think that's a really interesting question, and and it's not one that I that I um, in, in terms of do I see the differences? I haven't quite broken it down to the point that I can see those differences um, with with much certainty yet. Um, I do think those kind of organizations, you would hope that they, their practices and their kind of values are already very aligned with the kinds of things that we are promoting and that we talk about in the open education movement. And so you would hope that they would be more advanced down, down this road. Um, but I have had comments from people who work, for example, in, um, in open universities saying, despite the fact that we are an open university, we are not doing very much in this. Um, and um, and so I, th I think that that's um, you know that's been been very interesting. Um, I, it's it's also because I've you know in some ways in this study I'm kind of asking about everything, and that's meant that there is a lot of um, a lot of interesting stuff, but it's sometimes quite hard to compare across the sample because people pick up on quite different aspects to tell me some you know um, detailed free text comments about. Definitely. Yet this community would be uh, very happy to to go through these findings. So whenever you're ready, Leo, please share them with us and we'll be also happy to support and uh, provide feedback. Uh, OK, Thanks thank very you very much. Thank you very much. OK, so we're going to zoom in into uh, Flanders, Belgium now. And we have Frederick de Ruiter with us from MIMO, the Flemish Institute for Archives. And uh, Frederick will uh, will. Um, 
share with us their experience as an uh, archive or coalition of different archives um, working together uh, in uh, education. Uh, Frederick, welcome. Um, the floor is yours. You. Great to have you with us. Yeah, I will start by just sharing my screen. Excellent. And normally it's working. Can, yes. Yeah, able to see it now. Um, presenter mode. All right. So uh, good evening to all of you. I'm, uh, I'm uh, Frederik, and uh, I'm a teacher myself, and also work part time for uh, Memo, and that's indeed the Flemish Institute for Archives. And um, I'm just going to yeah, tell you how we try to open up archives for teachers and pupils uh, with our platform, the Archives of uh, Education. Now, um, let me first briefly introduce to you uh, Mimo, uh, or Memo as we call it in, in, uh, in Dutch. That's the Flemish Institute for Archives. We are funded by the government of Flanders and we, or our task contains of four parts. First of all, we digitize uh, all kinds of um, yeah, uh, physical carriers, for example, um, audio and video tapes, uh, VHS uh, tapes, uh, compact discs, and so on. And then the uh, yeah, next step is that we archive them um, and that we try to preserve them in a future-proof way, also a sustainable way. And I think for today, the most important thing uh, to uh, explain to you is how we try to make them accessible, how we try to uh, make that digitized materials accessible for specific target groups. Um, we do so by using different interaction platforms, and I'm going to talk about one of those interaction uh, platforms. And another um, yeah, bit of our task is that we also share our, our knowledge with other um, yeah, players in the Flemish heritage field or other people or um, institutions which are um, interested. All right, I have to click. This is just, uh, was a bit too quick. This is just a picture of our team, just to introduce to you. And um, you can again uh, read uh, our yeah, main or core business, our main goal. It's also a way to find our website. So if you uh, have a look at the presentation again, you can click on it and then uh, it will lead you to, um, to our website. And so we want to help cultural media and government organizations with advice and practical support and also make content accessible and usable. Um, okay. Uh, let me just, I just have problems by clicking. Let's go to the next one. I hope this will work. I think I'm now on our website. Uh, let's go back to the presentation. Yeah, all right, sorry. Um, oh, I can't get out of this. Uh, ah, that's better. So, um, as I told you, uh, we have different uh, platforms to to uh, interact with specific target groups. And one of uh, those platforms is the Archive for Education. Um, that's our way to bring audiovisual content to the classroom. And I'm just going to explain you a bit how we do so, um, how we work um, yeah, with that platform. Now, um, the Archives of Education uh, is in fact a free audiovisual online database on which we provide content from 58 partners. Uh, those partners are public and commercial TV broadcasts, for example, but also culture and heritage organizations. But we also um, provide um, materials from also the Flemish government and other institutions. Now, um, this is just an overview of all our content partners. So we digitize a lot of uh, audiovisual materials from 165 content partners, but not all those materials can be found on the Archive for Education. Uh, we made a selection and you will find um, yeah, audiovisual resources from 58 partners with audiovisual content on that platform. Now, um, Archives of Education, that might suggest that we have a lot of old materials, but um, we also try to be very up to date. So that means that you can uh, already find uh, clips, for example, from last week on our platform. So um, there is a broad range of uh, materials that can be found on the Archive of Education. Um, we already talked today about uh, copyright, while we also have to deal with copyright. Uh, all the materials that can be found on our platform um, can be um, made accessible 
because we do get the exception from the Flemish copyright law that um, we can open those resources to a broader audience um, because there is an exception for education foreseen in that copyright. Um, we also ask an agreement um, of our content partners and um, we also ask users to um, accept the terms of use. So that's the only way we can, we can do so. Um, all right. Um, yeah, access to a platform, it is an open platform, the, the Archives of Education, so it's a closed platform. Um, all our users have to uh, make an account um, and we have three main groups of users. First of all, the teachers, um, also the training of student teachers and um, the platform is also accessible for pupils of secondary education. Um, we digitize a lot of archives. That doesn't mean that um, our teachers will find the entire archives on that platform. Uh, that won't be very useful, I think. Um, it will also be very um, handy to just go through all those different clips. So we ask other teachers to make selections. Eh? So uh, we, we work demand driven. Eh? Um, the selection of clips is made by and for teachers. And also our users can make user requests. So if they have seen something uh, on television, for example, they do know that some museum has a very interesting clip about a specific topic, they can ask us to put it on the website, the Archives of Education. Um, and from time to time, we also work with other uh, educational partners. So when we do project with them, they can also uh, ask specific clips from the MIMO archive. Eh? And as you can see, MIMO archive is a very uh, extended one, but on the archive for education, you will uh, only find 24,000 uh, selected audiovisual items. At this moment, we already have uh, 64,000 users, teachers or trainee teachers, and also 100,000 pupils, secondary education, who already work with the materials on our platform. Um, 24,000 fragments uh, from, as I already told you, 58 uh, different uh, archives. And last year, most popular um, items were in secondary education, something about the conflict between uh, Russia and Ukraine. And um, yeah, um, that's it, right? Okay, now how do we work or how do we enable teachers to use audio and video in the classroom? Well, we also want to guide them a bit on our platform. Um, first of all, they can just browse through the entire platform, through all the different clips, and they can use filters eh, just to search on a keyword or on subject and so on. Um, so that's one way. We also make editorial collections. Eh? So we already provide a selection of audio and video according to subjects um, which are based on the curricula, the Flemish curricula. So we, we also make collections ourselves and yeah, provide them on our platform for uh, teachers. Um, teachers can, um, when they find a very interesting clip, they can select a clip, they can put it in their own collection, they can build own collections, they can trim um, a clip, they can annotate, add extra information to it, to those audio and video clips. And so in that way, they can make collections uh, of their own. And from, um, well, uh, this month on, um, we also, uh, or it's also uh, possible for a teacher to put their own pupils to work on our platform. They already had access to the platform, but now we extended that a bit and we also gave them other ways to work with uh, the materials on our platform. Um, pupils can yeah, do um, all kinds of exercises. So for example, you as a teacher can select one clip, you can share it with your pupils as an enlisting exercise, but you can also give them the ability to, to search uh, through the entire archive themselves and uh, make their own collection with very interesting clips. So that's another way to work with the material um, as a teacher just by uh, yeah, making it accessible to your pupils. So this is an example of just uh, one of the, the exercises, just a clip to watch. And as you can see, you can provide a lot of extra information or just questions uh, with that clip uh, when you share it with your pupils. Why? did we do so or why do we want to work in that way? Well, uh, next to just providing all those materials to teachers, we also find it very important that pupils get access to um, um, those clips. 
um, that, that's a good way, I think, to make them uh, media stabbiness. Eh? They, they can uh, evaluate all those uh, resources and uh, also the metadata can be um, seen by them. Um, I think that we provide a very safe and trustworthy environment. That's also very important. Yeah, this isn't fake news that they can uh, yeah, rely on all the information they get in those uh, clips. So that's also one of the reasons. Um, and it's another way also to train their search skills. They can just use the platform as, um, yeah, as, as an archive to, to, to look up their own um, sources or resources and also very important is that they can make up their own collections that's another way to just yeah let them create something digitally um, or digital content creation and next to that next to just being a platform with a lot of clips we um yeah we also yeah make up our own collections which are based on the latest school curricula um, we give didactic hints and best practices uh, just to inspire teachers um, or just how to learn then uh, how to work with audiovisual materials in the classroom. Um, we think of new tools um, to interact with audiovisual materials, for example, interactive uh, exercises with video. And uh, we, uh, we support teachers um, we are through live and online workshops and also through those uh, didactic hints. So that's it, uh, a brief presentation of our platform or how we try to open up uh, the Flemish archives for our yeah, teachers and pupils also. Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, Frederick. That was uh, very uh, interesting and very inspiring. And also, you, I think you touched upon many uh, topics that uh, have been discussed during uh, the panel discussion earlier on in the first session, in the first part of this meeting. Um, there is there is a comment from Isabel in the chat, like. Uh, saying that you have, and I fully agree with that, really impressive numbers when it comes to the the, the usage of the platform. Yeah. So I will turn this uh, um, applause into a question. Uh, what is your dissemination strategy? How do you make this work so well in terms of engagement? How, how do you make this collaboration and the interest from the educator's perspective? Uh, how do you make it work on a daily basis? Well, I think that has grown um, on a very organic way, I think. Um, we do not have a, a very big promotion campaign or something like that. So um, I think that the best way to do so are our workshops. So we, we do invest a lot in, in workshops for teachers. Um, and that's also the way um, yeah, how we can first of all, explain our platform, but that's also the way to find other teachers. Eh? So it's sometimes very difficult to, to communicate with a teacher. Eh? You can communicate with a school, but at school level, yeah, they have to spread that information to all those different uh, teachers. But if uh, we organize uh, those um, workshops, well, the best way to, to get promotion is just by mouth to mouth, mouth to mouth, uh, they, they just, yeah, tell other teachers that it is very interesting. And that's, I think, the way that we got that big. Um, another way to do so is to work together with org other organizations um, and um, other also uh, educational partners, I think. Um, for example, um, some museums have done some projects together with us, and then they refer to us in their, um, in, yeah, in, in, the products they make, for example, or we have also educational publishers who work with the platform. Uh, they also refer to us. So those are all different kinds of ways to yeah to become known. I think in in the educational world. Uh, congratulations yet again. I uh, think uh, yeah, if only it was open. <laughs> yeah, that's, for, for that's someone to, like me, so to jump in. Uh, and but I I absolutely understand the limitations. And uh, it's already excellent that you have an exception that allows you to, to create a platform like that and make the, uh, the most of the, uh, the amazing collection that you, uh, that you have in, in the Flemish archives. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much again, uh, Frederick. Thanks for joining us. Very and good. I encourage everyone to, yeah, uh, whenever 
possible to, to visit the lovely um, uh, collection of Mimo online. And OK, I'm going to then take you home, uh, I guess, back to Warsaw, uh, asking Ola Janos from my own Centrum Cyfrowe to, uh, to take you through, to take us all through our own experience uh, dealing with culture and education. Um, Ola, the floor is yours. Thank you so so much. I I will just share my screen and hopefully you will see it in a moment. Okay, I hope it's working. It is working. Um. So yeah. Uh, after all these inspiring presentations, uh, now it's my uh, it's my chance to share with you the story of a project that is still in progress, and that is our approach to um, to openness uh, in education and culture, um, and it's a project in which we uh, that we approached with openness um, as a dimension of everything, and I will try to explain what that uh, means. Um, first of all, I, I represent, as Maya has just mentioned, Centrum Cyfrowe, but in particular, uh, um, an open culture team within Centrum Cyfrowe uh, that established an open culture studio. This is our creative lab aimed at opening up the resources of cultural heritage institutions uh, for the purpose of creative reuse and also educational uh, uses. And uh, everything we do is research-based, but practice-oriented. So as you know already, in Centrum Cyfrowe, we conduct a lot of research, but we are trying to use the resources, the data that we gather uh, to, to implement programs and projects that are solving uh, certain challenges. And then one of the challenges that we have identified uh, as an organization that has education and culture as two main areas of, um, of interest, that there is the gap that has to be bridged uh, so that there are uh, these all amazing resources, cultural heritage resources, but they are not always accessible for many reasons for cultural, uh, for educators uh, and teachers. Um, so what we do in, in the Open Culture Studio is we promote open access to digitized cultural works, we promote CC licenses, we provide training on copyright for heritage professionals, but we also create tools for GLAMS. And the project that I'm going to talk to you now about is the project in which we are actually creating a whole system and some tools for, uh, for cultural heritage institution that uh, and the tool has to like one of the goals of the of the whole tool is to uh, to provide access to cultural heritage resources for teachers and educators so we've partnered up with the the Zachenta national gallery of art in poland and we were lucky enough to receive a grant that uh, allows us to to conduct a project uh, that is very extensive. So there are a couple of phases that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, because we basically approach the, the problem of access to digital heritage resources uh, holistically in a holistic manner. So uh, we, we want to change the way people access and make use of uh, digital cultural heritage through this project, but also then make, um, make an example out of it. And um, in the first phase of the project, we conducted extensive audits and preparations. So we've checked the legal status of the works that are in the collections, the accessibility, infrastructure, metadata standards. We also did some audience research. So we gathered a lot of data and then in the second phase, we used that data to create new architecture, new idea for how to hold uh, access to the cultural heritage resources of this particular institution can work, but also like how these collections of these institutions of this institution can be accessible also through other platforms such as Europeana or Wikimedia or others. And then in the third phase, and this is exactly where we are now, we are developing the new system uh, that will provide access to digitized cultural uh, art resources. But we also de develop an API with a detailed documentation. We want to provide the open access to the code of the system that we are building with detailed documentation. 
and to the website that we are building, but we also uh, develop uh, instructions and guidelines and explanation to whole project that can then serve as a manual, let's say, for other institutions, uh, cultural heritage institutions that want to do something similar. Uh, but what is most important probably for us all gathered here is that we also develop two dedicated open tools. One is dedicated to educators and students, so all people dealing with education, formal, formal and non-formal, and the other one to persons with disabilities. And our goal is to bridge the gap between users and digital cultural heritage. So through these two tools, we want to uh, we want to make sure that the collections that are digitized and and that are accessible in this new system that they are also uh, accessible for the, these particular groups. Uh, and how do we do it, that? So we decided to start with the needs of those we designed for. So we uh, we conducted research, um, and then we 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 are working on creating a tailor-made solutions that will give them easy and open access to art and culture gathered in one place, which is important, as we know from the report that was presented uh, today, with no additional bar additional barriers, either legal or technical or the ones that can uh, restrict access for persons with disabilities. And what is even more important for us is that after these tools are developed, and uh, this will be next year, uh, we will share the code uh, openly in our GitHub. So this will be also accessible for those who want to adapt that tool or make use of it or, um, or create something on the basis. Uh, of this tool that we are building. And we actually start uh, developing the concrete ideas for the tools next week um, uh, as part of the uh, hackathon that we organize. Um, so it will be an exciting week for us. Um, and I think that's it. And I hope uh, I wasn't, that wasn't too long. Um, so uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. No, definitely um, uh, within the the time frame. Um, I I have a one question. Um, so there is a comment in the chat. I will come back to it. But uh, I have a question uh, about the focus of the the tools. So the one is on education. The other one is accessibility. Why these two? So that, that's a great question. Thank you so much. So this is very much linked to the mission and the profile of the institution itself. So Gazahenta National Gallery of Art in Warsaw, it was one of the first institutions that um, approached openness and accessibility as something that they defined as core to their mission. So when we partnered up with them and started discussing the, the ideas for what actually should be the focus of what we do, uh, then they very quickly, uh, that, that we very quickly agreed that uh, providing uh, um, access to resources for education and for pe persons with disability is something that is both uh, relevant from our perspective as Centrum Cyfrowe, but also from the perspective of the mission of the institution, because they have already been very involved uh, in the process of creating accessible, uh, accessible um, educational materials for persons with disabilities, for example. They also have an extensive accessibility team within the institution, uh, and they've, uh, they have an amazing uh, education team that uh, was very like uh, involved in working with uh, all sorts of um, educators and teachers. So this was something that we felt we should de like develop further or that we should actually take, take as a basis to in moving forward. Uh, and it was also very uh, strongly connected both in the, in the case of the institution and our intentions to actually connect that with openness because uh, Zahenta National Gallery of Art was also one of the first institutions in Poland to, um, uh, to uh, um, let's say, implement openness as something that is important for their mission and how they understand their role. And one of the, the great achievements of, of this particular institution was that they 
um, they attempt that they approach the authors of the works that they have in their collections, which are contemporary artworks, and they um, they try to renegotiate the contracts that uh, they signed in the past, so that they can CC license the work, the digitized uh, works. So you you can say that we we found an ideal partner, and very quickly we understood that uh, we both both us as Centrum Cifrowe and Zahenta, the National Gallery of Art, that we understand openness broadly as something which is not only related with the copyright, but also with wide equal access to, to digitized cultural heritage and uh, kind of naturally accessibility and access for education uh, came to the forefront. Thank you very much for this. There is a, a, um, a, a call from the chat to need for more information. I think it's also being provided as we speak. But uh, as it is an ongoing project, I think it's it's definitely worth following. And I'm also sure that uh, that uh, you will be sharing more information, also you know reports and updates um, once uh, it's completed. And uh, and now I think we can invite everyone to follow up on the hackathon. Uh, this is upcoming uh, uh, very soon. Uh, right, and um, hopefully uh, we'll have some exciting projects to share. Uh, thanks again. Thanks for joining us. And um, I think it's a, it's a time to wrap up. I it's it's a bit of a challenge to put all of these four uh, very different presentations together, but I think I don't have to. And this is this is actually amazing because they exactly show like how and how many different angles on the topic of openness education and its relation with culture and a glam sector especially um, there are so uh, I think uh, I hope you enjoyed them I hope you got inspired uh, there, there have been um, some um, I think um, uh, methods recipes put in the chat too so gathering different inputs uh, from today so there is a quote from uh, Isabel about a research-based uh, plus practice oriented plus capacity building plus national outreach efforts uh, equals increased reuse uh, for education I would add to that uh, I think something that really struck me from Leo's presentation but also it was in Frederick's in all uh, in uh, yours all that too uh, the need for a really a policy and uh, this um uh the um cordons to open up so also from the legal perspective so i would i would still add a bit of uh copyright and a, the uh policy elements regarded to to copyright to the element but uh this would be me i think we're getting close to the method um and this is it from me. Thank you very much to all the speakers, to all the presenters today, uh, um, to uh, Natalia, to Leo, uh, to uh, Frederick, and uh, to you, Ola. Uh, thanks for joining. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. And uh, I'm, I'm saying uh, good afternoon, and I'm passing the floor to Anahita. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maya. And, uh... This is the end, um, I can say. And uh, thank you again for being uh, with us today. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed it. And please remember that you can find also our report uh, on our website. And uh, I can just make a reminder that all charts and the questionnaires are free for you to use and reuse it. So um, make a profit of it. Um, have a great rest of the day. And I hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye.